This is Hog Farmer Chris from the Hog Farmers Charitable Foundation. And before you start listening to Red Zone in the Lab, check out our Amazon Smile, a simple way to support the Hog Farmers Charitable Foundation every time you shop, and it's no cost to you. We're back! Welcome back to Red Zone in the Lab with Deuce. Welcome back. This is season three of Red Zone in the Lab podcast. We are going to be discussing entrepreneurship, education, black history, health, movies, family, and of course, sports. Please follow, subscribe to our YouTube channel, our Twitter, and our Instagram and Facebook, and also website www.redzonelab.com. Welcome back. This is Red Zone in the Lab Podcast. I'm Dion Deuce Blackney. And entering the lab today is nine and eight, man. We welcome you into the lab, man. We're gonna talk about some some 49ers today, man. I appreciate you for taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. You know, I think there's no there's nothing I like talking about more than the 49ers, sadly. And I think that my my girlfriend knows that. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a curse at this point. <laughs> yeah, man. He's the host of the um Nine and Nate's Nonsense podcast. That that when I when I first saw it, I was like, that's a that's a different type of title. Where, where you get that title from? How you come up with that title? So it's actually kind of a crazy story. So um out of college, I got a job in radio in Seattle. And um I was the only a Niner fan in a whole entire Seahawks radio station. And um because of that, <laughs> that like, had to be wild. <laughs> it was it was interesting, right? And so I, you know, I had a lot of opinions that Seahawks fans obviously didn't agree with. And uh, one day, my boss comes up to me. He's like, "You need to do a podcast. You need to do a podcast and just talk about the 49ers so you don't talk about it on the radio." And it was called Nine and Eight's Nonsense. And back then, it was just kind of like a thing I was doing for fun. And then um, when I moved home after COVID, I laid people off. I ended up getting hired by a company called Niners Nation. I did a show called Niners Nation. And it was clever. <laughs> yeah, and, it's um, clever. But when I decided to finally leave Niners Nation to, to branch out on my own, I was like, no, I'm bringing back Niner Needs Nonsense. It's a good name. You know, I'll just have some Niner colored on there. You know, people know what it is. They know who I am. They know they know, you know, what it's about. And so I don't know. It's, it's always worked out. It's always been my I like the name personally. So, yeah, it's cool, man. I like it, too, man. But let's let's get into a little bit about about now. how long have you been? 49 a fan are you a certain generation or you just kind of picked it up along the way yeah so um my father was born and raised in texas and um he moved home uh he moved to california when he was real young mm -hmm. and he didn't really root for the cowboys which is kind of weird because most people from texas are generally like cowboy fans mm -hmm. he didn't have a football team he moved in with a guy who was a diehard 49er fan started taking him to games my dad became a huge niner fan and i was just kind of inherited it right and um you know, there's the story I like to tell everybody is I was eight years old uh, when Terrell Owens caught that ball in the end zone from Steve Young. Yeah. And from that day on, I've always been a Niner fan because that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I remember this old man next to me, you know, I'm eight years old and I still remember this to this day. The old man next to me says to me, you know, you're never going to forget this for the rest of your life. And I haven't. It. it was one of the most amazing things ever, you know, just seeing him catch that ball, get smushed by the two Packers and everyone, all of candlesticks going nuts it was one of those things you just can't forget. And so it's why I'm a Niner fan today, really. All right. So like speaking of young, right? Montana or young? Um, so it's kind of hard. So I'm 31. So I never really got to see Montana play. I think his last year was in 1991 or something like that. Maybe mm -hmm. it was 1990. 89. I know they won the Super Bowl in 89 against Denver, which is part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, I was a Super Bowl baby. But that's besides no, the no, point. No, 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 no. We're not going any further. I need to hear that story. <laughs> uh, so uh, the most famous blow in all in all of Super Bowl history is 55 to 10. Yeah, it was Dan, uh, not Dan. I'm sorry. It was, it was John Elway and, and Joe Montana. And my mom and dad were, you know, younger, obviously, and they were bored. And so by halftime, the game was over. Right. Like everyone knew Joe Montana was going to win that game. And so they went and, you know, had fun. And, and, and here I came <laughs> eight months later. I was born in October. Super Bowl was in February you know, towards the end of February or beginning of February, whatever, but I was born in October. So like 
you know, I tell everyone I was a Super Bowl baby. I was born because the 49ers <laughs> won the Super Bowl. So that's great. <laughs> um, but back to the question you asked me, it's Steve Young for me, just because I got to watch him play a lot more. Um, you know, I got to see him in person. And I think Joe Montana is probably a better player, you know, mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of like what he was able to accomplish because Steve Young only won one. But Steve Young was kind of an athletic freak. I think people forget, like, you know, with, with the, the age of the athletic quarterback, the Lamar Jacksons, the Josh Allens, Steve Young was like that. You know, like Steve Young was, he was fast on his feet and he had a cannon. And so Steve Young was always my favorite. But Joe Montana, man, I don't know if you've watched that Joe Montana documentary they did on Peacock. But if you, have, if you don't know about Joe Montana, yeah. there's, that guy's that guy's wild. Like everywhere he went, he was snubbed and he found a way to earn his job. So, I mean, if I'm talking about personal experience, it's Steve Young. But overall, as a, as a fan of football, I think it's Joe Montana. Yeah. So when, you, when we think about people that's kind of leaving the game at a at an extremely early age compared to position groups and we think of people like Jim Brown, right? Jim Brown left early. Uh, he still had a playing days ahead of him. I think he wanted to go into Hollywood and do things that route. Or you think of Barry Sanders. He, he didn't leave because he didn't want to play no more. He just didn't want to play for the Lions. And they yeah. didn't want to release him. So then you come to like Patrick Willis. And every every, every generation seems like there is a, a generational player that leaves early. And for that generation, he was that guy. What did that do to the fan base when, when that came down that he was going to retire? I think it's kind of interesting when you talk about that stuff, because obviously I don't, I was never around when Joe Montana was traded to the chiefs. So I never experienced that. And obviously I was really young when Steve young, you know, decided to leave. It's just funny because when you talk about the 49ers, the first thing that comes to any fan's mind, who's not a Niner fan is Steve young and Joe Montana, right? Like right. they mm-hmm. immediately went to Jeff Garcia after that. And like Jeff Garcia was a good quarterback. Yeah, like he was. that guy is, I think the most winningest, Canadian football quarterback of all time or something like that, like some crazy stat like that. And the guy was good. He just had happy feet, right? He, and he never won anything, despite the fact that he had some pretty good football teams. But then you look at the quarterbacks after that, you know, Alex Smith is, I think you guys up there in, in, in Washington probably really respect that guy. But by the time he got to you, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't who, who, who he became with Kansas City. And I think Jim, Har- or Jim Harbaugh basically, you know, helped that guy's career. But up to that point, I think he had like, a different offensive coordinator every single year. The guy was just incredibly unlucky. Kaepernick comes in. He's an absolute stud and he should have been the future of the NFL. And, 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 you know, we can talk about the 49ers bungling things. That's the worst bungle ever, but none of those guys, I feel like my experience with those guys can replicate what people, the experience people had with, you know, a Steve Young or a Joe Montana. So it's really hard for me to, to, to really explain um, how important those guys are to yeah, and fans what about, and stuff. For me, when it comes to Patrick Willis, when he retired, right, he was he was arguably like the the best linebacker. And I know we had, um, you know, Ray Lewis and those guys, but he was right up there with those guys. So, you know, him retiring uh, uh, abruptly like that was r- really surprising to me when we talk about players retiring early. And then you can think of Megatron, Andrew Luck, different things like that. How do you, do you think they, those type of players, these are like big time, big now. I mean, Andrew Luck was looking to be the next guy in a sense. So do you think that has an effect on the league or you think we just kind of forget about it? It's hard because I think like you never forget the greats, right? You never forget the guys who changed the game. You know, like Tom Brady, I don't think people are ever going to forget Tom Brady. That guy is, is timeless. I, Peyton Manning, I don't think people are ever going to forget that. But there are some guys like, I don't think enough people talk about what Dan Marino did. Like Dan Marino was a phenomenal football player. And I think that people kind of get misconstrued because he didn't win the Super Bowl. And I think that that guy, like his arm talent, you know, like we it's, talk about Russell yeah. Wilson, right? We talk about how good Russell Wilson's arm is. Dan Marino had a better arm. Yeah. And nobody talks was. about the guy. Yeah. There's so many different quarterbacks when you look at the history of the NFL that nobody talks about. And I think that um, the greats will always be talked about while that, you know, the guys who are just almost there, I, th- I think Dan Marino is a hall of famer. Like that's crazy to me. And no one yeah. talks about Dan Marino, how talented he was. Um, yeah, uh, I, I can't think of him. Uh, maybe it was Viking. It was a Fran Tarkenton. God, that's oh, name. it was a Vikings Tarkenton. player. Sorry. You know, Fran Tarkenton is not talked about a lot, but think about where the NFL is now. You know, every quarterback runs, every quarterback right. has some sort of athletic ability. 
Fran mm-hmm. Tarkenden was like completely, yeah, you know, was. way before his time. He was. The guy way, was yep. super talented. He could run everywhere. You know, Michael Vick's going to be forgotten because of the dog stuff. But mm-hmm. Michael Vick was so good. Michael yeah. Vick was insane. He was early too. Him, yeah. Randall Cunningham. Randall all, Cunningham's all another one. Yeah. And we just don't talk a lot about the guys who were like, you know, top 30 or 40 all time. We talk about the guys who are top 20. And I think that there's just so many quarterbacks that are, you know, will not won't be talked about because they didn't win a Super Bowl. And I think that it's hard because I think there is an argument to be made, and I'm not going to make it today, that Steve Young mm-hmm. had more arm talent than Joe Montana. Okay. And so you can make that argument, but nobody's going to agree with you because Joe Montana has four Super Bowl rings exactly. and Steve Young has one. But there is an argument you could make there technically. Now, I don't want to make that argument because I don't want to get in fights with people and, and argue with people. <laughs> but I think that, the, the, that you can always say, you know, Dan Marino, and this isn't, I'm not going to say Dan Marino's better than Joe Montana, but Dan Marino had a skill set that could be thought of as better than Joe Montana. Now, Joe Montana was just Mr. Clutch. But when you look at his arm talent and the things he could do on the field, there are things that, of Dan Marino that, that could be construed as better than Joe Montana. It's just, it gets... You know, if you don't want a Super Bowl, nobody remembers you, right? Exactly. Yeah, and a lot so, of, especially quarterbacks. It's exactly. sad, but they are really measured by Super Bowls. Absolutely. And so I think that's kind of a problem with the NFL because I think there's a lot of talented football players who are never going to Super Bowl. You know, you mentioned Barry Sanders. The guy was the oh. greatest running back of all time, the yeah. most talented running back of all time. And the Detroit Lions were run so poorly that they ran the guy out of town, <laughs> you know? And they did the same thing with Calvin Johnson, who was an absolute freak. Like, nobody yeah, looks like Calvin Johnson. People like to pretend DK Metcalf does, but nobody ran like Calvin Johnson. Yeah. DK Metcalf like doesn't run like Calvin Johnson. Mm-hmm. So it's just like the guys who don't win Super Bowls are kind of forgotten. You know, they'll be put in the hall, right? But, like, nobody talks about them that much. Yeah, There's I just agree, so man. many good <laughs> football players that nobody really talks about. That's and my because, point. Because I kind of, of like a Super convoluted Bowls. way to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah because, exactly. Because, because of the, the lack of Super Bowls. But let, let, let's come to present time. What is going on with Jimmy G? <laughs> I knew this question was coming. <laughs> um, so here's the deal with Garoppolo. And this is going to be the most honest thing I can tell you about Garoppolo. This isn't me playing the character I play on the internet. Jimmy Garoppolo came into San Francisco in a time where things were dire, right? Things were really bad. They just come off of, of firing Jim Tom Sula and Chip Kelly back to back, who were terrible head coaches. Like, don't get terrible. me wrong. Nobody wants terrible. nobody wants them coaching their football team. <laughs> he came in and he won six games and they didn't really have a choice. They could have franchise tagged him, but they had the money to pay him. So they paid him. Right. He gets hurt that first year and doesn't really look good in any of those games. He didn't look good against the Vikings and he didn't look good against the Chiefs. He didn't look good against the Lions. And people could f- continue to forget that he looked awful the year after Mm -hmm. you got the contract. And now the story is coming out that, you know, he disappears and whatever. Some of that seems true now to me, but then he comes back the next year. Kyle sets up a system that makes it super easy for him. They go all the way to the Super Bowl. The game is put on his shoulders at the end of that game. He has to make one throw, one deep ball throw that most NFL quarterbacks, if you're paid $25 million a year, you should be able to make that throw. He misses that throw. Mahomes wins the Super Bowl you know, becomes the guy he, 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 you know, we always thought he was right. Comes back the following year and it was a COVID year. Things were weird, right? Const- he was constantly injured. And when he had a bad game, for some reason, they take him out and they would say he has an injury. It gets to the point where they play Buffalo. And I understand Buffalo is probably one of the best teams in the league, league that year. But if they beat Buffalo, they would still be in the hunt for the playoffs. It comes out that Jimmy Garoppolo is healthy enough to play. He's choosing not to. Wow. And so, <laughs> that day was the day I really lost a lot of respect for Jimmy Garoppolo because the, I understand it's Buffalo. You're probably not going to win, but you should be playing on your football team and not being like, well, what if I get injured again for next season? No, you had a chance to make the playoffs. The most important thing for the 49ers every year, as long as Kyle Shanahan is the head coach and they have the roster they have should be at least making the playoffs. Cause we saw last year, they won the, made the playoffs. as like a, you know, a low seed. We won only the NFC championship game. And so we lost a lot of fans lost their respect for him. Come back, you know, last year they draft Trey Lance because they're done. Trey Lance has to sit a year because he's from North Dakota State and he missed a year of football. He has to sit, learn the system. And 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 there was times where he was gonna start, but he got injured in preseason. And so it got basically got kept getting put off. 
He gets hurt again. I mean, the guy's played one season where he wasn't hurt his whole entire time here. One season where he wasn't hurt and they went to the Super Bowl. Last year he was hurt, but they still went to the NFC Championship game. So Trey Lance takes over. He's now the quarterback. What do you do with Jimmy Garoppolo? Well, now at this point, you put yourself in a hole. Either you're going to cut him right before the first week of the season or you're going to sit and wait out the situation. So the situations right now are Deshaun Watson gets suspended for a whole year. Potentially Browns get kind of crazy. They don't want to play Jacoby brisket. I know his name is Brissett. I call him brisket. I do too. Uh, okay, Carry good. <laughs> good. You play, you don't want to play Jacoby brisket. So then you, you go get Jimmy Garoppolo for a fifth or a sixth round pick. You're the giant pay him. What? 28 million. I, yeah. At this point, I think the 49ers would just eat the contract and get so? a, just to okay. get a pick. But I, and that's why I think that they might, they might just cut him too, because, at this point, if he's the, the comp pick is a third round pick, I think for him. So it's just like, it's such a bad situation. They, and they've put themselves in such a bad situation because they want to sit here and wait out the, all the situations. The Seahawks, they're going to put Drew Locker, Geno Smith out there. I'd probably rather have Jimmy Garoppolo out there than those guys. Those guys stink. And then the Giants have Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor. And I really respect Tyrod Taylor a lot. But like, as a Commanders fan, I almost said the other name. As a Commanders fan, That's you have to know good. that guy's stinks yeah. he's effing terrible and so it's up to these teams to kind of figure out what's going to happen if i had to make a guess i think that someone gets desperate and they just trade him the way to get rid of them yeah they i have just don't to. i don't it's, think he's on this it, team to start they have like the browns they have to me they've had the roster the last three years they should be competing. They should have been competing. And I, I just don't think they can waste another year with Brissett or Josh Rosen. You know, mm-hmm. they, they they don't have time to waste. So you, you have that. You 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 have the, the Giants. Daniel Jones come out there stinking up this next preseason game, too. They might have to make a move. But I just don't think you all should cut him, though. I think you should just kind of wait and w- w- wait it out because he's not in the building, right? He's still away from the away from the team, right? He didn't even travel with the team to Minnesota this week. So if you want to get an idea I mean, he's how not that's even coming going. To practice, is he? I think he throws on the sideline with some of the injured guys. Okay. The guys on the pup list. But no, okay. he's not on this team as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And, and, and if you really want me to talk honestly about him, I've heard a lot of things. I don't want to get too much into it. I've heard a lot of things about him that he's kind of an asshole. You know, he doesn't sign autographs for children. He... I mean, that story came out. Did you read that story? The guy disappears Mm-mm. after Send the offseason. That's insane. Yeah. He, he Apparently, he disappears after the offseason. He just, no one can call him. No one can reach him. And that's not a good teammate. You know, if any quarterback on the commanders were doing that, like, you would feel bad. Like, you would feel like that's not a good thing for a quarterback to do. And apparently, like, teammates can't even reach the guy in the offseason. And I think that's awful. And so... The fact that you, you, there's so many things around him that just aren't good. It's just time to part ways with the guy. Get mm-hmm. him out of there. You know, thank you. Goodbye. You know, whatever you want to say about the guy. It's just, I'm done. I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to see his face. You know, every time I see that stupid Subway commercial, <laughs> I flip the channel because I can't deal with it. I just don't want him around anymore. And, you know, I, and I think the best thing was them to come out in that first preseason game last week. Mm-hmm. Trey Lance to throw a bomb and score a touchdown because that's something Garoppolo never did. And that's mm-hmm. what changes the, uh, the 49ers offense this season. It makes it so they're not one dimensional anymore and people can't just play a couple yards off of the ball and be like, okay, you're going to run it. I'm going to bring two, two safeties in yep. and you're going to have to run through my safeties. No, they have to at least be honest. And if people are honest with, you know, with the 49ers on offense, the 49ers are going to find a way to cook them. Rezo and laugh. be right back. Hi, I'm Christian Miles native Washingtonian and real estate agent servicing the Washington metropolitan area. I started my career as an investor and later transitioned to the residential side. I really wanted to leave the investor side because I wanted to connect with people. Building relationships is important to me. I understand the buying and selling process can be challenging. I get it, I've been there. I'm a mom, wife, friend, and neighbor. I absolutely love helping families and connecting with people. Going through the home buying and selling process is stressful enough. When working with me, I make it fun. As a realtor, I think it's important to be able to connect with you. Every detail is important no matter how small. Let me take care of the heavy lifting while you focus on the joys of finding a new home. Something I live by 
People may not remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. With me, it's an experience. Welcome back to Red Ghost in the Lab with Deuce. Yeah, let's talk about that balance and let's talk about Debo a little bit. Um, you know, you all paid him, paid him his money. Uh, I think that was a good Worth every move. penny. Yep, yep, yep. So what's his, um, of course, outside looking in, we hear all the stuff, he don't want to be running back. And then it comes out that he has certain uh, clauses and certain clips that he can that he can uh, obtain with, with, with rushing yards. And I think one of them is like 300 or some yards rushing. He's going to get that before week 10. I mean, right earlier than that, probably. Yeah. Um, and I, I think they, they did that for him. But what's, what's, is, is he, is, is Elijah Mitchell, right? Is he, is he ready to take the bulk of the running or is how, how often is Debo going to be used in the, in the running game? So I think it's kind of interesting. I think not, not a lot of Niner fans are talking about it is Debo Samuel never said, it was never said by Debo that he doesn't want to run the ball anymore. No one ever okay. said that. That was a lot of like hearsay here, back and forth, right? I think they're still going to do it. I don't think they're going to do it as much because they have this kid, Ray Ray McLeod. And I think that Ray Ray McLeod will be how they, they divvy up those carries where he's not carrying the ball all the time. I also think that Trey Lance changes the way the offense plays because now the offense is going to be, it's still going to be run first, right? But it's going to be a much more talented passing offense than it's ever been. If you watch Jimmy Garoppolo, a lot of crossing routes, a lot of stuff in the middle, never anything, you know, on the numbers, never anything on the side of the field, really. And he misses those throws. And we've already seen, you know, Trey Lance in that Texans game. And even the little bit of snaps in that first preseason game, he's going to throw the ball beyond the numbers. He's going to throw the ball beyond 10 yards. And he's not going to sit there and just camp the middle and wait for the check down. And so I think that's huge. And I think that because of that, they're going to see an even bigger, you know, ability, better ability to run the ball because of the fact that Kyle Shanahan has done. I mean, he's done wonders with this run game because nobody knows who Elijah Mitchell was before last year. Nobody knew who that guy was. And now he's, you know, everyone has him in fantasy football. I think that he has. That's what the Shanahan's are known for, right? Exactly. Yeah. And he has all these weapons. He's got Trey Sermon. He's got uh, Tyrion Davis Price. He's got Jeff Wilson. They've just got so many guys that when some guy goes down eventually because you're running the ball so much, there's another guy to come up and take his place and, and just kill it in the run game. The Niners' weapons on offense are just insane. And, I mean, I think Kyle Shanahan has the best set of offensive weapons he's ever had in his entire career. Uh, yeah, you can say that. Because that, that 2012 team, we had, we, had, we, had, we, we had some players, man. And I, I would like Kyle Shanahan is, is a great coach. Like they, they can find a running back off the streets because because of the scheme. Right. They can scheme up uh, those guys. They can scheme up holes and they, he's awesome in that. But one thing about Debo, what is Debo the receiver? What is he like? Debo, the receiver is interesting because I think that Debo, the receiver is a little bit different. Um, he's I, I think he does have some sort of like there's been a couple games where drops have been a problem for him. And that's Mm -hmm. not me, you know, crapping on Debo. I think that he's one of the best in the world at what he does. Mm -hmm. I think that what he does is yards after the catch. I think that if you can get him the ball in stride where he's not having to catch the ball over, you know, contested, he's going to run people over. He's going to run faster and he's going to demolish people on his way to the end zone. And I think that that's one thing that he does really well. And I think that um, I think, and here's my hot take for your show. I think that Ayuk is a more important wide receiver for yep, the 49ers. I agree. I, I agree. think that uh, fantasy owners of Brandon Ayuk will be very happy because I think that, you know, everything we heard was that Trey Lance and Brandon Ayuk are completely in, you know, in, in, in touch with another you know, all off season. They completely, you know, work well together. They've done everything. And I think that because, you know, I mentioned this is going to be a little bit more heavy passing offense than it's been in the past. I think that that's going to allow Ayuk to succeed to really succeed, to make uh, contested catches. And I think people forget he's fast as hell. Mm-hmm. That dude is a, is a blaze. And so I love Debo. I think that Kyle Shanahan has a role for Debo. You don't pay Debo unless you have a role for him. I don't think his primarily role, primary role is going to be as wide receiver one. It's, it's wide receiver, wide receiver two, 
and uh, wide receiver running back one, uh, because I just think that that's the 49ers identity. That's who they are. They're going to run the ball down your throat with every player on the roster. I just think with the contract, they're going to not use Debo in the running back role as much as they did last year, where they had to because Jimmy Garoppolo is so inept at everything he does. Trey Lance, a lot is going to depend on how he can deliver. The first preach in the game, like you were saying, the bomb that he threw, uh, it was on the money. It wasn't It wasn't short. It was in stride. Um, that's what he can do. Um, and then he also has the threat of run. Uh, I think he ran on, on a, a RPO. He ran in the preseason game. And I think just having that dimension, Shanahan, he hasn't had that since RG3. So, um, and I think he's 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 chopping at the bit to really put that uh, offense together. Like, who who is Trey Lance this year? What are you all expecting? Well, let me give me a quick example um, because a lot of people get a lot misconstrued with Trey Lance when it comes to comparing him to other people. Trey mm-hmm. Lance is Trey Lance. Like, I'll start there, right? But you know, people want to compare him to Mahomes, and I I don't think that's the comparison. People want to compare him to Allen. I don't think that's the comparison. I think if you wanted to talk about who Trey Lance is and who he's the closest to in the NFL is, I think it's Dak Prescott and someone you're very familiar with. Dak oh, Prescott yeah. <laughs> has the ability to run the ball at any point, right? He's talented enough to run. He's big enough to run. But Dak Prescott, when you watch Dak Prescott, he's looking to throw the ball every play that he has the ball. He yep. wants to throw the he ball, is. and he runs when he has to. Mm-hmm. That's what Dak has always been. And I think that's what Trey is. Trey is not a run first quarterback. Anyone who tells you that hasn't paid attention. Yes, he ran a lot in college, but I think that that's part of North Dakota state system. And I think that that's the way that they emphasize him because he was so much bigger than everybody in, you know, in FCS, he's not bigger than everybody anymore. He's faster than a lot of people. He's not fast on Lamar, but he's pretty fast. But I think that his role is going to be to not turn the ball over to make plays when, when Kyle sets them up and, and to take less sacks and make sure you're not standing there in the pocket. I mean, Garoppolo would stand there and not move. And and, in a way where it's literally just standing there and patting the ball over and over again, right? (laughs) Not doing anything, right? Not, not even trying to throw the ball, just looking, 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 can't find anyone open sack. Right. And so Trey Lance, the ability to have those legs to run outside of pocket, look a little longer, Maybe run to the, you know, run over to the first down marker outside, you know, off out of bounds. Don't stay in bounds because you don't want to get killed. And I think that that first preseason game as well, you saw that he could slide. And I think that that's something we didn't see last year. He dove head first because he came from a place where he was bigger than everybody and he could Mm -hmm. do that. You cannot do that in the NFL. You cannot dive head first with Aaron Donald come and hit you. It's just not possible. Nobody can do that. Not not even the biggest quarterback in the league can do that. And so he has to learn to slide. And he has to learn to get the ball out and he has to learn to to make smart decisions with the ball. As long as he's not turning the ball over, you know, two and three times a game, Kyle Shannon will find a way to beat most teams there. I I don't know if you've ever watched 49ers all 22. There's a guy open on every play. It's miraculous. I've never seen anything like it. There's always someone open. Yeah. There's plays last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's plays last year against Minnesota where Ayuk is literally wide open, waving his hands and Garoppolo doesn't throw the ball to him. And it's just, it's one of those things where this kid has the potential to be way better than a lot of rookies are their first actual starting year because of the fact he has Kyle Shanahan. And I think that that's kind of the Patrick Mahomes effect. Patrick Mahomes came into a system that was just perfect for him. There was no place better than to be with Andy Reid, where he also has Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey. Trey Lance has George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, and a pretty decent offensive line with the best tackle in all football, as you best know. Best tackle in all football. So ah, it's I can't just, get rid of this, man. He's just, I mean, he's set up for success. And, and he's if, getting if, if better. It happen, he's getting better as he's getting older. Oh, That's yeah. wild to me, especially for a left tackle. It's wild to me. <laughs> he's the best. And I think that it's, 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 it's a really good indictment on Trey Lance. The fact that anytime Trent Williams talks about him, Trent Williams is like, he's the guy. Yeah, he's the, he's our guy, you know, and I think that that's something that, you know, a guy like Trent Williams, who's been around the league for so long and has seen, you know, so many different quarterbacks. I don't think he would just say that, you know, right. Kyle Shannon doesn't say Trent Williams. Can you make sure you butter up Trey Lance whenever you yeah. do interviews? That's not Trent. That's not who he is. You know, that's not who he is. I've heard the guy talk. He doesn't butter people up. He really, truly believes that Trey Lance is the guy that's going to lead him to his Super Bowl because Trent wants that Super Bowl. I know he does. 
Just like Joe Staley wanted that Super Bowl. And and so, I mean, it's going to sound like I'm too positive, and I think that that's just who I am. I think that the 49ers are set up for so much success. It's insane. And Trey Lance is just going to get better every year. So, you know, in the next couple of years, I, I suspect they win the Super Bowl personally. I think they're talented enough. They're built well enough. Uh, it just comes down to how much of a jump does Trey Lance make from last year to this year? And, you know, how and vice versa the next year and the next year. Because, I mean, if, it, if in three years and he's about to get his contract extension, they've won the Super Bowl already. I don't, I don't really need anything else, man. I just want one. <laughs> just give me one Super Bowl. If Trey Lance can do that, I will be content for the next 30 years of my life. So the offense has plenty of weapons. Let's go to the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. Tell us a little bit of, uh, about the defense. You guys is, is known for your defense. Um, tell us a little bit about the defense and, and some impact players. So, I mean, they have the best linebacker in all of football, in my opinion. That's Fred Warner. I, I, I don't think a lot of people would second guess that he's the best linebacker in all of football. The guy's a stud. He's an absolute leader. He knows how to communicate with these guys. And he's really shown that he is the most important player on defense. And I, and I think that people forget that they also have a guy named Aziz Al-Shair, who has been a stud as well, been great in coverage, great in the run game. And then that, that's just talking about the linebacker core. We get to this defensive line, Nick Bosa, third best defensive lineman in the league, probably behind TJ and uh, Aaron Donald. I can't think of too many other people. And then you have Eric Armstead, who's been a lot better than his stats show. He's been a tremendous run blocker. They have this kid, Javon Kinlaw, who is finally healthy for the first time. He's fine. He's taking yeah, over. I can't the, wait to see him, man. Uh, God, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of this guy or you've seen like what he looks like on the field. He's bigger than everybody. Yeah, he's huge. that's why I can't wait to see him. Yeah, he's yeah. huge. They're going to start him this year. And then they have this kid, Samson Ebicam. I guess he's not a kid anymore, but he's a pretty decent pass rusher. There's also, I mean, I can name a bunch of players that, you know, your listeners won't even know. Charles Amenahu, guy they got from Houston, have full control over for the next two years. He's a pretty decent pass rusher. They're just a pass rush, you know, um, factory because of the fact that, you know, they have Chris Kosarek, who specifically, even when he was at the Lions, I, uh, I used to hang out with Cliff Averill when I worked in Seattle. And Cliff Averill told me when we hired Chris Kosarek in San Francisco, he's like, you're going to love him. He's the best defensive line coach I ever worked with. And Cliff Averill is a Super Bowl champion. Like yep, he's not a, he's not some Cliff scrub Averill. defensive lineman off of the right. off of, the, and you know. And so it's really shown. Chris Kosirik might be one of the best D lineman coaches in all the league, and he's been consistently. I mean, he's been consistently amazing. He's turned Nick Bosa into one of the best players in the league. He made DeForest Buckner better than he'd ever been before we traded him to to the Colts, and he's made Armstead better. So I I've nothing has me second guessing on on and if Armstead or Kinlaw or of Kinlaw and the other guys that they have behind him. And I'm not even mentioning Drake Jackson, who they drafted with the second round pick. You know, he played for USC back when Clay Helton was there. Clay Helton is an absolute monster for like destroying players. Like, I mean, Amos, Amon Ross St. Brown was like one of the best receivers I've ever watched. And I think he went like 17 wide receivers into the draft, like <laughs> something insane because Clay Helton just had no idea what he was doing there. And so it's the same thing with the defensive players and Drake Jackson, you know, he's an absolute, you know, beast. And I think that the problem was they had him like cutting weight when he doesn't need to cut weight as a D lineman in college and all this stuff. And so a lot of Niner fans have a lot of hope for him as a guy who could be a situational pass rusher. And then we get to the, 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 the secondary, which is where things get a little questionable. You know, Trevarius Ward, I think was a great pickup in the off season. I think that the chiefs didn't really use him. Right. I think that he was really talented. I think the chiefs just didn't want to pay him because they have so many other positions. They yeah. They got pay. a lot of people to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Travis Ward's tremendous um, for them just because I think he might be the best corner they've had since Richard Sherman. And they didn't even have like prime Richard Sherman. They had Richard Sherman after he'd exactly. been in Seattle and got a bunch of injuries. I exactly. think Travis Ward could potentially be better than the Richard Sherman they had. Um, they had this kid, Emmanuel Mosley, who they caught as an undrafted free agent. And he's just been a rock. You know, anytime someone got hurt, he, he come in and, and he's just been good. And so now he's getting the starting job. They have this kid, Samuel Womack. They drafted in the fifth round. He's going to probably be the... Um, the slot corner, he had two picks against Green Bay against Jordan Love, who, I mean, I think Jordan Love sucks, but he the looks picks bad, were, man. Yeah, he took terrible. <laughs> yeah. Jordan Love, and, and I think he looked really good. And then I think people don't, don't really understand Jimmy Ward. I think a lot of people don't understand who he is. Jimmy Ward's one of the best safeties in the league. The guy's phenomenal. And I understand he's going to be hurt to start the season, but the guy, he's, when, he's not, when he's not hurt, he's, he's 
I don't want to say he's Earl Thomas or he's, you know, Cam Chancellor, but he covers the field like Earl Thomas did. And yeah, what Earl does. Thomas would do yeah. um, was Earl Thomas would be, he could put, you could play cover one and Earl mm-hmm. Thomas would have the whole you field covered. Single hat, yep. And then uh, a guy that we're really hopeful for and where the questionableness comes in for me is, is Talano Hufanga, who also played for that USC team with Clay Helton. Um, and, you know, he was fine last year. He came in a couple times because of injuries, but it'll be interesting to see how he evolves with this team because, you know, I think that there's two positions on the 49ers that if you really want me to be negative about, and it's, it's, it's strong safety and it's center. Um, and strong, strong safety just because I don't know who Talano Hufanga is. You know, you drafted him last year in the later rounds, and now he's the starting safety because Jaquaski Tart is now with the Philadelphia Eagles. And so it'll be interesting to see what he looks like this season. Um, I think that they do have the best set of corners they've had there, and so maybe that'll help him in the long run. But this should be a top-five defense. I know I just went through a lot, but this should absolutely be a top-five defense. If they're not, I think that would be pretty surprising for a lot of NFL fans. Yeah, so what uh, the offense looks great. The the defense is looking to be top ten. Uh, as as a team, what are you guys? What are the fans looking at as far as uh, the season record projection and how far they can go into the playoffs? You know, I think that people have to keep their expectations in check. You know, I, I like to joke around and be like, I think this is the best team in the NFC. And I think that there's a chance they're the best team in the NFC. And I think there's a couple factors that kind of lead to that. Tampa Bay can't keep their offensive lineman healthy. It's insane. I never yeah, seen lost like a it. second center yesterday. They man. lost two centers. Tom Brady's not even going to be back for another week to be there. I, I don't know what's going on in Tampa Bay. I, I feel like he should have stayed retired, um, but maybe they begged him to come back. I don't know what's going on there. There's they're very good. Right. But I don't think that, I don't think they're too big. Of, I, I think they're the biggest threat to the 49ers, of course, but I, I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm too worried about 44 year old Tom Brady, even though he is the mm-hmm. goat. I know that's probably blasphemy. He's going to beat us in the playoffs. Um, Green Bay, the 49ers own them. It's wild. I never see anything like it. it Rogers can't beat us. They were beating us in, in the snow and all of a sudden we get a punt a block uh, punt. And here we go. We win the game. We go on to, to play the Rams. And then finally, of course, the Rams who are the Super Bowl champions, but, I don't know how much you've heard, but there's some weird stuff going on at Rams camp. Um, it seems like Stafford has like an, a little bit of arm fatigue. Um, you know, something going on with that. Basically, you know, he, he's limited in his throws. I don't think he's playing the preseason at all. And I don't know if you remember when Ben Roethlisberger had an arm fatigue problem. They ended up sitting him for the rest of the season, you know, a couple games into the season. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but the Rams did get worse this offseason. Von Miller's not there anymore. OBJ's yeah. not there anymore. You know, Allen Robinson's a good football player, but he's not OBJ. Right. And, and and I just don't think that I don't think they're that's the scary big bad wolf right now. And the 49ers keep in mind, um, you know, Dion, we beat them six times in a row Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> before they beat us in the NFC championship game. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan owns Sean McVay. And in the one game that he didn't, because Jimmy Garoppolo looked like a bonehead in that fourth quarter, they got the best of us and they got to go beat a Bengals team that shouldn't have been there to begin with. And so our expectation is to make the playoffs and then see what happens because we do have a rookie quarterback technically. And if we make the playoffs, anything's possible when you have Kyle Shanahan as a head coach and then anything's possible because the NFC is pretty weak. You know, I, I, I think that your division is probably the most competitive division just because I don't think Dallas is that good. I think Philadelphia has a good roster on paper, but Jalen Hurts sucks. And I think that Washington <laughs> is, is kind of on the rise again. And I, I think they are better they're looking better and better, you know, every week because of the fact that Jahan Dotson is going to be an absolute monster. Next I can't to Terry. wait, man. It's a scary Terry. And I think people don't understand that. I, I just wonder if Carson Wentz can get him the ball. But I'm, I'm not here to talk to Washington football team. My bad. But um, I just think that the NFC is really weak. And I think that that helps the 49ers. They should, if they don't make the playoffs, I think that'll be a disappointing season for 49er fans. And now, you know, if they get to the Super Bowl and they lose, that'll suck because we've lost three Super Bowls in 10 years. <laughs> But, I mean, the AFC is just better. I mean, the AFC West has Kansas City, Denver, the Chargers, and the Raiders. And that's not even remember talking about the Bengals, the Bills. You know, the, I think the Dolphins will be slightly better. There's just so many different teams in the AFC that scare me a lot more than any team in the NFC, personally. But What, what do you think about the Saints? Me. Before I let you go, what do you think about the Saints and, and Jameis Winston? Um. You know, 30 for 30, right? It's yeah. kind of a, it's an interesting thing. But he has thing. LASIK. I think that's he a, has LASIK now. So yeah, he had the LASIK. 30 for 30 now, with so. LASIK, right? 
<laughs> he's never, he hasn't been healthy ever since he got, you know, since the 30 for 30 year, he has never stayed healthy for a whole season. And I like James Winston. I respect James Winston, the crab leg story. I don't even ever seen the crab legs video yes, uh, that he did with Jim Harbaugh. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire yeah. life. He's like, you, you addicted to sex. You, you ever seen that video? Yeah, yeah, it's Jim crazy, Harbaugh's man. like talking to him like it's an interview. And, and James was like, no, sir. No, sir. That's hilarious. And that guy is kind of a meme in, his, in himself. Like the fact that he won that game. Against yeah, yeah like, eating the W's and all that. That guy's eating the W's. And, and the best one is, you know, my trainer, he told me, he told me just to stay. St- what did he tell me? He told me just to stay ready. And it's like, yeah. it's like, he's a meme, right? But that team's good. Like, that's a good They're defense. They're really good. The defense is really good, yeah. I, I'm not afraid of Michael Thomas. Um, I think Michael Thomas is just like a slant king, and I think the 49ers could, could lock them up if it came down to it. And I don't know what's going on with Alvin Kamara. I, I, I don't. I thought he went to jail or got in trouble during the Pro Bowl. No, they actually crazy. said that um, they postponed the trial, so it's not going to happen to, like, probably the the off season that's what it's looking like so okay, he's probably so going to play i do think the saints are decent i you know and but i i just don't think with 30 for 30 as your quarterback crab legs man you know big old james winston who makes the goofiest the, have you ever, I, I, I could talk about this guy for hours by the way yeah, he, have you he's, seen he's his wild, workout man. videos where he, they're throwing yeah, bags yeah. at him and he's just like what is this doing for you james yeah. anyways <laughs> I, I i just I, i'm not afraid of them as much as i am like tampa bay green bay the, and the Rams. Um, and I, and no offense to you, of course, I'm not afraid of anybody in your division personally. <laughs> none taken, <laughs> none taken, none taken. Um, let's the, just this one more question about Cal Shanahan. If you do go again and uh, and you all lose, is he on a, on the hot seat? Like, how close is he to the hot seat? Do you think? I don't think he's anywhere close. Okay. You know, the fact is, 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 the Buffalo Bills went to four Super Bowls and lost four straight Super Bowls. Oh, yeah, yeah, and like, yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. I'll give you a scenario. Would you rather go to four straight Super Bowls and lose all four? I would rather go to four straight Super Bowls. Or never go to Super Bowl ever yeah. for the like 10 or 15 years, right? Yeah. You would rather go to four Super Bowls and lose. It sucks, but it shows that your team is almost there. Or it's competitive mm-hmm. enough. I don't want to lose. Nobody wants to lose. Nobody, nobody doesn't want to watch their football team in January and February. And so... If the 49ers file Kyle Shanahan, this is, this is an exclusive for your show right here. The mm-hmm. 49ers file Kyle Shanahan, they will be bad for the next 15 years. Absolutely, because that is the kind of pay, payback that the organization deserves. Because Kyle Shanahan, and here's, here's here it is, is the best head coach the 49ers have had since Bill Walsh. All Bar right none, now. absolutely. <laughs> I don't care about All right the, now. You're going to have them high about people looking at you. I know. I don't care about the fact that, you know, he blew the leads or whatever. The stuff he does on offense and the it's way crazy. that they've been able to yeah. build these rosters is crazy. The fact that Jimmy Garoppolo went to the Super Bowl with Kyle Shanahan is insane. Yeah. Like, if you've watched Jimmy Garoppolo as much as I have, the fact that that guy played in the Super Bowl is insane. I cannot get over the fact they went to the Super Bowl with Jimmy freaking Garoppolo and they almost went again last year, if not for the worst fourth quarter I've ever seen in the history of the NFC Championship game. And so... I just think he's a magician, man. And a lot of people try and talk shit on. I'm sorry. A lot of people try to talk smack on him, you know, in spaces and in in Twitter and 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 the world. People talk to me all the time, and I. That's the one person on the 49ers you cannot talk smack to me about because Kyle Shanahan is my messiah. That guy literally brought us back from being one of the most unwatchable garbage football teams I've ever seen in my entire life to being in the Super Bowl three years later. Like, how many coaches are doing that? Taking Not over many. a team that won two games, two games, and then they're in the Super Bowl three years later. I can't name many. And I, and I know there's things that he does wrong. There's play calls he makes that are wrong. You know, he gets a little conservative. But, man, I would put up with the conservativeness and, and that stuff for winning than losing and, 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 and not having that personally. Well, there you have it. That is 9 and 8, man. <laughs> Host the 9 and 8 nonsense podcast. Uh, he, he He's on Spaces. Just give us some of your your content, how we can follow you, how, how we can, um, you know, reach some of your content. Yeah. So um, you can find me on Twitter at Niner Nate 49. I also do the podcast. I do a YouTube show. If you search Niner Nate's Nonsense on YouTube, you can go up there, subscribe, check out the show. We do a show every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I have two different guests, two different, two completely different Niner fans. One that is very positive, one that is very negative. So it's kind of like a kind of a fun dichotomy we got going on there. Uh, it's also a podcast on Apple, Spotify, all the places where you get podcasts. So if you want to listen to anything about the 49ers, you want to hear me yell 
and scream about the 49ers as the season goes on. Um, I think this is going to be one of those seasons where it's just going to be, I think it's going to be pandemonium. I really think that, that it's going to be one of those years that 49er fans are not going to soon forget. I think that the addition of Trey Lance just changes everything, man. And if he is, if he's a top 10 quarterback, I'm Ooh, going to be yeah. miserable to be around for the next five years <laughs> because don't let Kyle Shanahan get a top five quarterback. Just don't let it happen. I mean, you saw what he did with RG3. You saw what he did with Johnny freaking Menzel. You saw what he did with Jimmy Garoppolo. Like those guys are not even, you know, anywhere close to top 10. If he gets a top 10 quarterback, even Matt Ryan probably was barely top 10, if not, you know, top 12, 13 when he had him. Like don't let Kyle Shanahan get a top 10 quarterback because man, Oh God, I'm yeah, it's, so it's ready for the nasty. season to start. Yeah, it's gonna be crazy if he if he's able to get a top ten quarterback. But yeah, man, I'm 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 looking forward to 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 touching bases base back with you. Of course, we play you all week sixteen. Uh, yeah. we're we we'll be in San Francisco. So leading up to that week, uh, most of the times, well, during the games this season. We we gonna we gonna be running a um a live show Mondays and Fridays so you know kind of prep for the game so I, I I'll reach out to you in a couple of four and have you all come out so we can just kind of talk about give a little preview of the game um so just be on the lookout for that um nine and eight uh again Matt I appreciate you I thank you for joining I thank you for taking the time uh um to join us I thank all of you for watching thank all of you. For listening, this is Raise On the Lab Podcast. I am Dion Deuce Blackney. One beat, one sound, one heart, one love. Thank you for listening to Red Zone in the Lab Podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Red Zone in the Lab. And you can download our podcast at Spotify, iTunes, and Podbean. And please visit our website at redzoneinthelab.com. Thank you.